Many people think that zero animal impact is ideal, that our land would be better if there were no animals, but we need certain types of disturbance for healthy landscapes. That's how our ecosystems work. So in the case of the cattle, when they are in their landscape, they are grazing and nibbling on the grasses stimulates the growth of those grasses. The roots slough off and become part of the soil. So welcome back to another episode of Our Podcast. Today's guest is Judith Schwartz, an author who explores environmental, economic, and land climate dynamics. She has contributed to esteemed publication such as Scientifica America and Yale Environment 360. Judith Schwartz is known for her book, Cows Save the Planet and Other Improbable Ways of Restoring Soil to Heal the Earth, which is today's topic on El Podcast. Thank you, Judith, for joining us. My pleasure. So let's just jump right into the first question. In your book, Cows Save the Planet, You highlight the significant decline in key mineral nutrients in our food crops over the past century. Factors such as soil mineral depletion have contributed to this decline, with levels of nutrients such as zinc, calcium, manganese, iron, and copper decreasing by an average of 50 to 100 percent. You also mention the alarming possibility of buying oranges completely devoid of vitamin C. Could you elaborate on the factors that have led to this decline in the nutrient levels in our food crops? Yeah, yeah. So that one thing that we tend to forget, because as long as something looks good, looks like the product that we are seeking to buy, that it's all okay. You know, like a a nice plump bell pepper, for example. But because of our growing practices, specifically because of in the way that industrial agriculture functions, our nutrients have been declining steadily. So, so many factors there that lead to this. Well, basically, we're not really thinking of our soil as an ecosystem. When I say we, I mean the industrial agricultural set of big companies that are growing food, small farmers, small organic, regenerative, biodynamic farmers, of course, that's different. We think that that fertilizer is key to growing crops. But if you step back and think about it, well, wait a second. Before we had these fertilizer products that we can just kind of put on the ground, the soil must have gotten nutrients in other ways, and that is true. But what we're doing when we have high nitrogen because nitrogen is often the limiting factor in the development of proteins in plants, what we're doing is we are sort of pumping up vegetation, vegetables, say, with nitrogen. And that sounds like, oh, well, that's not so bad as long as the plant is getting that. But what this means is that the whole system, the underground transfer and exchanges of different minerals. So a plant gets nitrogen from processes in the life cycle, the feeding and exchanges among different microorganisms. And so the plant sends out carbon through the roots in the soil, and that is food for different microorganisms. And then there are these exchanges that go on so that maybe manganese, a microorganism gives manganese to a plant. And all this is going on. It's beyond our comprehension that these billions within a teaspoon of healthy soil, that all of these invisible entities are active and creating the conditions for plants to grow. So when they get a big hit of nitrogen, that is telling the plant that you don't need to do all these other exchanges. So they're not getting those other nutrients. And then 
other things that we put on the soil, such as herbicides and pesticides, are changing the balance of fungi and bacteria and just changing the population of what's in the soil. So those exchanges are distorted. So many other things, such as the compaction of the soil with lots of heavy machinery, the fallowing of soil. I've heard farmers and soil advocates almost in tears when they drive through corn and soybean growing regions and after the harvest, it's all brown. And before the planting, it's all bare soil because... When you have bare soil, nothing is happening. And when you're starving out the microbiology, well, then they're not there to collaborate in the growing of plants as in natural systems they do. Yeah, what are some of the steps that individuals can take to make sure that they're getting food as nutritious as possible and not having these plants and crops with a 50 to 100% reduction or oranges completely devoid of vitamin C? So there are many things that, that people can do on many levels. First of all, you can get your hands in the soil yourself. And once you start doing that, and once you taste what comes out of the ground, you are forever changed. I can't even tell you how many people say that their lives have been transformed by growing their own food. Because that, once you do that, there's the satisfaction of that. There's the sharing with family members and children, t teaching children how these systems work and you know, how we can be empowered by growing our own food. But when I mentioned taste, taste is really important biologically that when something tastes really good, that is telling your body something. Now, th that it is healthy for you. The caveat here is that as many people have written in best-selling books, and I think we intuitively know that fast food or highly processed foods have kind of hijacked our sense of taste. You know, we're like that plant getting a, a hit of nitrogen. We get a big hit of salt and sugar and fats, and that allows us to fool ourselves that we're receiving nutrition. But we all know that when we eat a healthy, uh, something that's grown well in the ground, we know that there's something right with that. So that's one example. Getting to know our farmers. So when we know how that food is produced, then we can be more assured. And I can tell people that farmers love to talk about how they grow their crops because they are working hard. They are making decisions that may, to an outsider, sound very kind of picky. But rather than picky, they're nuanced. Why are they growing such and such a flower with their crops, for example. They're happy to tell you why. I would invite people to test themselves, to try a supermarket carrot and then a carrot that comes from a farm that uses regenerative and or organic practices. And then I'll just say one more thing, that when I was writing about this, the main source, the guy that I was hanging out with on his farm and talking about these matters with, his name is Dan Kittredge. And he was very, very dedicated to making it transparent to consumers what the quality of different produce is. And back in 2012, when I visited his farm in central Massachusetts, it was a dream that he had to have a spec trometer, a kind of device that you can point at a carrot and it is going to tell you whether it's highly nutritious and it has a lot of beta carotene and vitamin C, vitamin A, all of these different 
nutrients that we depend on. And then you can point to a supermarket version or one from a farm, and you can tell the difference. Well, that is no longer a pipe dream that his organization, the Bionutrient Food Association, I think it's I think it's bionutrient.org, sells these devices. So people can do this now and learn the nutrient profile of the produce that they buy. Yeah, it's a, it's a handy tool. Judy, you write, just because you're an organic farmer doesn't mean you have the nutrition right. You're not necessarily getting the biology. Often farms are doing the NPK thing, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium fertilizer regime. That's the standard in conventional agriculture. By other means, taking the conventional model and substituting organic materials, but not building a biological system. So can you kind of elaborate on this? Because it seems that just because you're maybe going to a farmer's market or buying organic food doesn't necessarily mean that you are getting a food that's more nutritious. And maybe that's where that device you're talking about could come in handy. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Generally, the small organic farmers that are at farmer's markets, this would not be a question because if they're putting the effort in to grow food in a small, medium-sized acreage, they're usually doing the right things mostly. But I make that point because in our system, organic, when you buy organic, you know that you're not getting the bad things, but we don't know that we're getting the good things. And that then is up to us to decide. I mean, when I go to the grocery store, and fortunately, I don't go to the grocery store very often because I am, I'm lucky enough to live in a place where I can grow my food for part of the year. But when I do go to the grocery store, I have a little bit of an existential crisis because do I buy industrial organic when I know that it's not necessarily such a great product, but usually the fact that they're not using the bad stuff or at it, that I can make that assumption, that usually wins out in terms of just offering a vote with my dollar to organic, but I still am not convinced that that's going to be such a, you know, a fount of nutrition. Yeah, that's an interesting way to put it. I've never actually heard the term industrial organic, but it's totally correct. I mean, I I kind of questioned organic stuff years ago when you're walking down the aisles of Walmart and they have an entire organic section. And then, of course, Amazon buying um, Whole Foods was that, I don't know, eight, nine years ago. And all of a sudden, a lot of the small farmers, they no longer bought from them anymore. And it really wasn't what most people think of when you say organic. Really, industrial organic is a way to to, dis, to describe that. Perfect. I'll just say one more thing about that. There's been a lot of watering down of organic and what it means. And one element of this is hydroponic products because the pioneers that helped create the organic, uh, you know, the criteria we're working on the assumption that organic means grown in soil. There are all sorts of implications of what hydroponic production is. But if anyone's interested, the Real Organic Project has been looking deeply into some of the problems and challenges in organic and why this matters for people who care about the integrity of the food that we eat is that this means that there's added competition for organic farmers that are trying to do the right thing, and some of them are finding it hard to sustain their businesses, just so people know that growers that want to do the best for the people who buy their food are facing many headwinds. So the more support we can give them, the better. Yeah, exactly. I mean, organic could be a marketing term, or it could actually be better quality food. It's a good point there, Judy. 
So let's jump right into the next question, which gets to the heart of the matter in terms of the name of the book. So as the title of your book alludes to, Cows Save the Planet, you discuss the role of cattle in soil regeneration and improvement. Can you elaborate on how properly managed grazing with large herds can contribute to minimizing runoff erosion and ultimately improve the overall health of our ecosystems? Sure. And you said you said the key phrase right there, properly managed. I'm not saying that a bunch of cattle is standing in feedlots or just on the land kind of left there to do their own thing is so great for our ecosystems because certainly it's not. But I chose that title because it is surprising. And the more work I do, the more research I do, the more important I see the understanding that animals create our ecosystems. I think people forget that. I wanted to call attention to that fact. Let's get to cattle. I'm in the U.S. and the great soils of the middle of our country that have brought such wealth to our nation, the Midwest, the Great Plains, those soils were created by living animals. The Great Plains, those rich soils were created by numbers of buffalo that we cannot even envision moving across the landscape. So to have rich soil, you need life. You need animals. So I learned that many people are managing livestock in a way that mimics the natural processes of such as those buffalo. And I can talk about how that works. Okay, so these are people that manage their livestock holistically. And how it works is, so you have cattle. And those cattle in nature would not be just staying in the same place. Rather, they would always be on the move because there are predators. So a holistic manager would ensure that the animals are continually moving. And depending on what kind of landscape you're in and the conditions of that landscape, that would be every three days, every day, every six hours, so that in continually moving those animals, you are ensuring that the land gets optimal animal impact. Many people think that zero animal impact is ideal, that our land would be better if there were no animals, but we need certain types of disturbance for healthy landscapes. That's how our ecosystems work. So in the case of the cattle, when they are in their landscape, they are grazing and nibbling on the grasses stimulates the growth of those grasses When they nibble those grasses, the roots slough off and become part of the soil, and that is very rich in carbon, those roots. They are pressing in seeds. There are plants, grasses that are dependent on animals to press in the seeds, animal-dependent grasses, so that you have a diversity of these higher-order grasses. They are pressing in decaying plant matter so that rather than sitting on the surface of the soil and blocking sunlight getting to the growth points of the grasses, that decaying plant matter is becoming incorporated into the soil. What have I missed? Of course, and their waste, their dung and urine adds nutrients to the soil. And because there are other animals trampling that gets pressed into the soil and incorporated. So those animals are there for a short period of time, and then they are moving en masse to another paddock, another area, part of the ranch or farm. Then the grasses that they have just left 
the plants are not overgrazed, but they are grazed, those plants have a resting period. And what I learned when I attended the new cowgirl camp, and I learned how to do this kind of management myself, and I actually made my own grazing plan, what I learned is that what's most important is the resting time, that it's not as much that the the rancher who's planning the grazing system is not as much where the cattle are that they're paying attention to, but where the cattle aren't. Depending on the landscape, they are having the grasses and forbs have the optimal resting period so that the plants are as healthy and robust as they can be before the next grazing. Can you tell the story in the book? Is it is his name, do you pronounce it Savory? S-A-V-O-R-O-I. Oh, Alan Savory. Savory, yes. right. And, you know, like, the, I think the elephant, you know, where he ended up, you know, was it calling, basically killing like 1,200 elephants because they had this wrong idea. Can you kind of tell that story? Yeah, yeah. So so Alice Avery, he's is very active. He's in his mid eighties now. He grew up in what was then Rhodesia and is now Zimbabwe. And he loved wildlife more than anything. I relate to that because my husband is from South Africa and wanted to be a game ranger himself when he grew up. And so I know that kind of love of the wild animals, the incredible animals in that landscape. So Alan became a, he studied biology, he became a game ranger. Starting out as a game ranger, he observed that the land was not as healthy as he remembered as a child, and the animals were not as abundant as they were as when he was young. And so he was concerned about that, as were many of his peers. Now, what they did was they made the assumption that there were too many animals. So they fenced out the animals or they culled the animals. But what he observed is that when they kept animals out of the land, rather than the land rebounding and becoming healthier the land actually got worse. So he realized that there's something about this assumption that we needed fewer animals on the landscape that wasn't working. However, in the meantime, it was his responsibility to guide the active land managers in the game park areas. They were setting up game parks. And he did give the order which was backed up by the science at the time, to cull 40,000 elephants. Now, I will tell you that this is being done, I will tell you many things. One is that there are people that have never forgiven Alan for doing that and say that they don't want to listen to anybody who had been involved in the culling of elephants. This is going on still in Botswana, there are still, this is still happening. When I was in South Africa, there had recently been a cull of elephants in the game parks. So this is still going on. The point that I would like to make is that this was a, like a tragic, pivotal moment in his life. For Alan, he grieved this so much when he came to understand that landscapes need animal impact that to redeem himself, even if in only his own eyes, he developed the, he made observation, scientific observations in the landscape and did a lot of experimenting to develop holistic management so that this would not happen again. And another thing that's really important about Alan Savory's work is that in this process of developing the holistic management model, that he also developed an understanding of how land functions, which is called the brittleness scale. And this isn't well known, and I'm going outside of people who practice holistic management, so I'm going to explain this. So he came to understand that 
how a particular landscapes function is really important. And that it's not so much how much rainfall a given location gets as how that rainfall, how that moisture is distributed throughout the year. So to give an example, South Africa, Johannesburg, where my husband is from, gets the same amount of rainfall as London, where he moved to as a young teen. Now, he remembers London as always rainy and dreary, and Johannesburg as always sunny. The thing is that Johannesburg gets all of its rain in a very short period of time, whereas London, it's distributed throughout the year. It's humid throughout the year. So London is a non-humid, a, a non-brittle environment, and South Africa or Zimbabwe is a brittle environment. The point is that when you have a place where there's a very defined rainy season, that landscape has different needs than a landscape like where I am in Vermont that has humidity throughout the year. So the way I describe it, and this is kind of my own way of describing what Alan Savory learned, is that in a brittle environment like Zimbabwe, nature had a challenge. And that was how to maintain moisture in the soil to keep plants alive. Because if you don't maintain moisture in the soil, well, then my, the microbial life dies, the plants can't get established. So you need moisture in the soil. How do you maintain moisture in the soil from the end of one rainy season to the beginning of the next? And the solution that nature came up with was through the behavior and digestive systems of ruminant animals. So in a place like Zimbabwe, the wildebeest, the zebra, the Cape buffalo, the antelope, all of those animals are not only fabulous and charismatic and beautiful to look at, but they are also moving moisture around the landscape. They are embodying moisture. They are doing all of those functions I described, depositing their waste, pressing in seeds, pressing in decaying plant material, doing all of those things that are building carbon in the soil. Carbon in the soil allows for more, more moisture to be held in the soil, and they are moving moisture around through their behavior. I didn't realize that it was 40,000 elephants that Alan Savory had called how, how many years is that over with those 40,000 and that was just in Rhodesia or Zimbabwe that didn't include yeah. any it might have been in um Zambia because they were working in national parks there animals exist in huge numbers i know this was way back in the 50s but i don't remember over how long a period this took place. But I do want to be clear that this is still going on. Yeah. You mentioned the implications of an industry that benefit from not finding solutions to agricultural problems as it generates significant income through the manufacturing, marketing, application of synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides. Could you elaborate on the extent to which the industry profits surpass those of farmers and the impact that this dynamic has on the overall farming and agricultural system? Basically, we've gotten a situation where there's built-in dependence on all of these inputs. And even experts that feel very strongly that we need to get off our dependence on, say, fertilizers, will say that farms need to be weaned off it, you know, because it's like 
you've set up a situation where there's almost an addiction. The soil needs these because the microbiology in the soil has been destroyed. They can't just go off that at once. If you're thinking only of a marketing selling of product paradigm, then creating dependence on your product is, you know, that keeps you in business. But that really is the case. And it's also built into the way that these products are sold. So you have glyphosate, Roundup, Dependent. You have products that are Roundup ready. This herbicide would kill most plants. There are crops that are developed to withstand that. So the farmers buy those seeds, and then the package is the seeds and the herbicide that kills everything except the plant that you want. And what's happening now is because plants build up resilience to the herbicides, then you need several herbicides stacked together in a product. So that creates dependence. And because farmers have been told that this is the solution to their desire to have a decent crop, they are not doing the other things that would help them, such as building the ecosystem in the soil and enhancing the quality of the soil, the richness of the soil. So they've gone down one path, which makes it all the much harder to go down another path. There was research done by a team in an independent research operation, and what they did is they, they compared corn, the yield of corn, between conventional input-dependent operations and regenerative farms, which are not using any of those synthetic inputs. And they compared. What they found is that the regenerative farms were far more profitable. They didn't get as high a yield in corn, but because they were... In, integrating other crops in the system. So it wasn't just one crop that they were growing. They were far more profitable. And then just another thing is that then they also had the benefit of insects, beneficial insects, that operations that use a lot of pesticides don't have. Can you kind of explain what regenerative agriculture is for kind of the layperson? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of tricky because the nuances of what regenerative agriculture is, there's no one definition. But basically, regenerative agriculture is agriculture that enhances the ecological conditions on the land where the crops are grown. And usually the focus is on the soil because when the soil is healthier, then the plants are healthier and everything goes on up from there. So it's not a synonym for organic farming? No, no, because organic farming can be done in a regenerative, regenerative way, but not necessarily. However, I would say that, I guess people would argue with this, but I would say that that all regenerative farms would also be organic. Although some people would say that in the transition to regenerative and or organic, there might be some use of chemicals. But my vote is always the less chemicals and ideally none. And I know when I've interviewed and worked with enough enough farmers and ranchers to know that that is that is absolutely possible. So I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about CO2 or carbon dioxide. You write in your book 
According to Christine Jones, soils hold more carbon than the atmosphere and all the world's plant life combined and can hold it longer in a more stable form than, say, trees. You go on to write, Ian Mitchell Inez, a South African rancher and trainer in holistic land management, told me, if we improve 50% of the world's agricultural land, we could sequester enough carbon in the soil to bring the atmospheric CO2 back to pre-industrial levels in five years. Can you kind of explain how the soil does hold so much carbon and how this whole carbon cycle works? Yeah, yeah. So that was the huge revelation for me that led me to this exploration of soil of this book. I had no idea that carbon lived in the soil. We know that good soil has a lot of organic matter, is rich in organic matter, and organic matter is 58% carbon. And Soil can go very, very deep. It can go meters deep. There are grasses whose roots go 20 meters deep. That's our reservoir of carbon. And much of what has gone into the atmosphere is from farming, is from agricultural practices such as tilling, plowing, fallowing, Overgrazing, undergrazing, bare soil. It, when you have bare soil, and there's bare soil all over the globe, as desertification, the loss of soil function, becomes more of a problem globally. Carbon it oxidizes, it combines with oxygen in the air and becomes CO two. Colleagues of mine at the Carbon Underground say nature wants her carbon back. So there it is. I'm not saying that we can keep burning fossil fuels because that has all kinds of implications, but we have agency. We can bring carbon back to the ground. And in doing so, we're having healthier better crops, more beautiful landscape, greater biodiversity, healthier people, healthier and more intact communities because people leave the land when the land is no longer producing, when people can no longer make a living on the land. Yeah, I find this passage in your book, and you can kind of pro provide some context to it, but I it's one of the more profound passages, I thought. And you write, there are scientists out there much smarter than me who say, I believe you are right, but I cannot imagine that everyone else who's focused on CO2 is wrong. I grew up under communism. Communism runs on the assumption that if everybody says so, it must be true. It's very easy and comfortable to make a mistake with the majority. And that's the end of the quote. I mean, what are the potential pitfalls of accepting consensus without a critical evaluation or debate on very complex topics. I forget which of the scientists from Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic, or... Po, po, no, po, po, Jan Pokorny. Yeah, yes. Yeah, it's a, yeah. yes, okay. So he grew up under communism. Um, yeah, this is extraordinary. That is in a chapter called the return of lost water. So Pokorny and Michael Krofchik and others wrote a book that fairly blew my mind, which is called Water for the Recovery of the Climate. So this is a pivotal point, and this is where your comment about a consensus about, in this case, that climate change is solely the result of rising CO2 levels due to the burning of fossil fuels, that it constricts our imagination. As a journalist, what I've always valued 
in anybody I meet, <laughs> my sources, fellow journalists, is intellectual curiosity. And our knowledge can only be as good as the questions that we ask. And so I invite people in understanding climate change to pose the question, how does the earth manage heat? Now, one way it manages heat is through the blanket of greenhouse gases, without which our planet would be too cold for us to survive here. That's one way, but even that involves the water cycle because the biggest greenhouse gas is water vapor. So if you look at how does the earth manage heat, one important answer is through the water cycle, through the phase changes of water, which represent a tremendous movement conveying of solar energy. So that's how our planet works. Every tree, every plant is taking in solar energy and releasing it through transpiration. And in so doing, cooling the earth. I mean, grass is like, you know, cooling this much, but trees, because they are turning heat into latent heat embodied in water vapor. We've got lots of things happening. So we understand the carbon cycle. And it, it, we talked about how carbon wants to be in the soil and how we can return carbon to the soil with all of these tremendous co-benefits. Okay, so we can have carbon in soil and biomass, animals and plants. So returning carbon to nature is a good collaboration with the carbon cycle. Then there is the water cycle, and the water cycle intersects with the carbon cycle. Water follows carbon and carbon follows water. And in the soil, when you can increase carbon in your soil, let's say from 3% to 4%, not only do you have greater soil biodiversity and healthier soil for growing plants, but also that increases the capacity of that land to hold water an additional 20,000 gallons per acre. So when you have carbon in the soil, you can hold more water. That means greater resilience to flooding and drought and wildfires. I hope that helps. My point is, because I got off the track, is to ask questions that allow us to see a fuller picture and reducing climate change to a very narrow definition or, or I don't know if people if that's an actual definition or that's kind of what the conventional understanding is it impoverishes our imagination regarding how we can better address it and our earth is far too complex to be reduced to very small components. And I feel strongly about this because this does show where we have agency because in terms of working with the water cycle and the carbon cycle, we have tremendous agency. Switching gears to GMOs, I found this interesting. You said that we have the GMO technology so it's as if the technology is looking for a problem to solve with it, what causes nutrient deficiencies and pest disease or weed outbreaks. Following the path, we eventually end up on a treadmill of pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, synthetic fertilizers, GMO seeds without solving the problems permanently. 
And this just kind of reminds me of our healthcare system as well, where we focus on managing sickness versus promoting wellness and promoting health and preventative measures. How do we find the best possible food and how do we actually avoid GMOs and things like this with the marketing? You don't even know what you're actually eating and they give things weird names and what's your recommendations, especially for people living, you know, say in a condo or something. It's easy to say, just throw your own food, but if you don't live on a farm or have the backyard or something, it's not really very realistic. So what are the things that people can institute? Yeah, it's really challenging because of the kind of food system that we have. Just being an informed consumer and getting to know your farmer, looking into buying clubs, for example, acknowledging that we may need to pay more for better quality food, you're actually saving in the long run because it's an investment in your health. These are all things on an individual level. One thing to learn is everybody can can learn more about this. And I know so many people whose curiosity about these matters have led them, inspired them to take classes on soil. So for example, there's an organization called Kiss the Ground that has a soil advocate training program. And people have gotten involved and their lives have taken interesting turns, beginning with taking that class, which I don't think costs that much. And I believe that there are scholarships. A colleague of mine named Dee Dee Pursehouse has courses on the soil um, carbon sponge. And I know that there are people who become activists, advocates, and farmers, practitioners themselves, teachers themselves through taking this course. Just know that there are possibilities of getting involved and really making a difference because this field is wide open because we all, when it comes down to it, want healthier foods. We all want better health for all of us. We all want more aesthetic and healthier landscapes. I thought your last chapter in the book was interesting because you kind of talked about money and asked the question of what is money. And in your book, I believe it was published in 2013. So that was 10 years ago. And I believe, I forget the exact amount, but the Federal Reserve was founded in 1913 and like 96% of all dollars have been printed since the Great Recession in, in 08. And of course, that was sped up with the pandemic in 2020. And then you mentioned Bitcoin, but Bitcoin you know, came out in 2009, so it was still kind of in its early days. How do you th think of money kind of post-pandemic, and especially with the debt ceiling and all the things that we have going on? We've had multiple bank collapses, FTX collapsing, been a lot of financial turmoil. If you could update that chapter, what your thoughts would be in 2023? Yeah, so I came to the topic of soil from writing about new economics. And what would I say now? It is kind of mind-boggling. But I will say that I did write a lot about local currencies and have been interested in how wealth flows through communities and how when you have locally based stores that keeps money circulating in town, whereas if you have chain stores that most of the money leaves the community, what would I say? I, I, I don't know if I would say anything new, to be honest. I would say that we need to ask questions of what is money, what is wealth, what incentives are, what kind of behavior and corporate behavior is being incentivized by our, our policies. I mean, the farm bill is a huge, huge matter right now that many of my colleagues are quite involved in. 
But what I what I would say, because I don't think that this gets talked about enough, is that it's worth focusing on regional economies. I would encourage people to really kind of bring a, a lens of regional resilience to just how we look at our economies. And, and maybe because I feel that bioregionalism is really important because, okay, during the pandemic, right at the, at the onset of it, I wrote an article about how our supply chains are becoming affected. And it became really clear that localities and regions can rally that if you have food produced in your region, you're okay. If you're depending on something to be shipped from one place to another and everything depends on time delivery, well, not so much. So building more kind of regional capacity, more resilience regionally, I think serves all of us. And regional economies are also important for us to think about. There's a book that I read that always stays with me. It's Jane Jacobs, Cities and the Wealth of Nations. And she talked about the importance of regional economies and how adaptable they are and how conditions that may, like economic policy that may make sense in one region doesn't make sense in another region. And I feel like like our that the dollar is always dealing with this because the regions within our country have very different circumstances. And the euro has bumped up against this too because what may be a good policy for Germany may not be a good policy for Spain or Greece because the euro is just one blanket currency. It can be a problem, whereas Jane Jacobs would have said that maybe Northern Europe might have one currency, maybe Southern Europe. Anyway, I'm not saying that we should trash the dollar, but just understand that we all have a stake in the resilience of the regional economy in which we live and that it's good to kind of consider that and consider ways that we all can play in building local economies, whether by local and, and yeah, just taking an interest in ensuring that there is local production for what is needed. Have you read any Peter Zeehan at all? No. Because he believes that, you know, kind of globalization is going to be coming to an end and we're going to be a lot more kind of regional and country centric going forward and that the pandemic has sped that up. But yeah, I think we do have to kind of get back to, to more regional approaches, especially the U.S. is so big. It's just a, a massive country. Right. It also makes things more visible, that so much is invisible when in in the global system where something just appears on your doorstep that was made who knows where, was shipped who knows where. I mean, eventually that's not going to make as much sense. There would be less of that. Judith Schwartz, thank you so much for joining us. I just got two kind of final questions for you. Are you able to tell people where they can find you, find your writings, your books, if you have any new books coming out? And then what is your parting thought, your conclusion, your final thought, et cetera? Sure. Yeah. So I'm I'm easily reached. I have a website, judithdschwartz.com, with a contact page. And books are my three books, Cow Save the Planet, Water in Plain Sight, and The Reindeer Chronicles are available there. Uh, what I would like to leave people with is that for all of our challenges, we haven't really been looking at 
the role of healthy ecosystems in climate change, in people's health and health, the vibrance of communities, and just invite people to know that all over the world, people are restoring ecosystems. And that is such important work, but it has remained invisible. And that's one reason that I wrote the book, The Reindeer Chronicles. And particularly with climate change, that healthy ecosystems regulate our climate, the role of healthy ecosystems in climate regulation. And just that this is great and meaningful work and invite people to open their eyes to that and opportunities to engage in that work, like I'm doing on a very, very small scale. I'm doing, I'm planting for, to support at-risk native pollinators. So that's one thing I'm doing and connecting with other people locally so that we can have a corridor for these pollinators and understanding that insects and pollinators are a base of our healthy ecology. So yeah, just that and just ask good questions because that will lead you to good places. Do you ever get asked about policy or things like that? I find it interesting that we have Greta Thunberg who gets asked to the European Parliament. She's been at the US Congress multiple times as if a teenager, some expert, but I find your book to be really interesting or things that you don't really ever hear people talk about, but are actual really applicable things that are pretty easily to implement and would benefit everyone with a healthier food supply. Are you ever getting approached by policymakers or congressmen, senators, or other politicians? Do you want your expertise? I'm in ongoing conversations with my own representatives and being in Vermont, you know, I feel very lucky that we do have a lot of access <laughs> being a small state. I had the opportunity to share. I basically did a kind of tutorial on regenerative agriculture with my two senators' offices. And one reason I was able to do that is my son was at that time an intern in my Senator Bernie Sanders' Washington, D.C. office. So that facilitated that, though I probably could have done that myself. And I did testify in Congress about animal impact and in a conversation about what is possible for our federal lands. So that was a really wonderful opportunity, a little bit nerve wracking, but it, yeah, that was, that was meaningful. So yeah, I could be less shy about that. Yeah, I, I do that. I do, I, I'm in touch. Yeah, that's, that is awesome to hear. Yeah, and I'm super happy. I really enjoyed your book. I also did read your Reindeer Chronicles. I did enjoy that as well, especially the chapter on Hawaii, just because I, I did live there. But the other chapters were interesting, a, a much different style than your book, Cows Save the Planet. So I do recommend that book as well. I just want to say thank you for spending so much time with us today. Well, it's my pleasure. And yeah. I, I appreciate it. That is it for this episode of El Podcast. And once again, if you guys aren't subscribed yet, please consider subscribing. And find us on Rumble, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts as well. We thank you all dearly for watching and listening. I will see you on the next episode.